Simon uh, with us for this opening keynote. Hello, Simon, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mehdi. Thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you. Uh, you are one of the few leaders who really understand the business and how, let's say, being embedded is making a big change and why APIs are, are, are a game changer into that. So the stage is yours and we will finish with some question from the audience. Great, okay, let me start. So uh, let me just check. Do you see the my slide there, my opening slide? Perfect. Okay, good. So I'm gonna talk about embedded finance and the $7 trillion market opportunity that it represents. And the image in the background, of course, is of a dollar note, which is uh, um, with a mask on because COVID has accelerated trends that have been happening for some time and accelerated this opportunity around embedded finance. So brief introduction to me, I'm a, I work with boards and leadership teams on new growth strategies. I particularly specialize in platform and ecosystem strategy. I work with lots of banks, insurance companies, wealth management companies, and uh, I specialize in how to build new ventures in new spaces. I, I work with the World Economic Forum on creating new research and sharing ideas. And I wrote a book last year called Fight Back, which is essentially how traditional organizations can fight back against disruption and fight back against old ways of thinking and acting. And if you like my analysis today, there are some links below where there's more details. You can see the analysis and read it in at your leisure. So let's start with the problem that embedded finance is addressing. And the first problem is that fundamentally, our financial system is not fit for purpose. And I'm gonna show you two examples here. The first example demonstrates that we cannot afford to retire. We're all living longer lives. The government does not have enough money to allow us or to pay for us to have a comfortable retirement. And the gap between what people need and what they have is very wide today and getting wider still. And in the US alone, the gap is about $30 trillion today. It's growing at 5% per annum and uh, it's becoming completely unsustainable. So we're just not able, we're not saving enough money to be able to retire. And that is a ticking time bomb uh, that we will suffer from later on. Now, in parallel to that, the banks, which traditionally have been providers of uh, financial solutions, uh, they don't, they're not really satisfying the full needs that consumers have today. And on the right hand side, you can see a survey done last year, where people asked, how satisfied are, we, are you with your bank? And in the United States, people said, yeah, we're pretty satisfied with our bank, but at solving 1% of our financial needs. There are so many unfulfilled financial needs that banks are not supporting. And of course, that is stimulating the growth of innovators that are helping to fill that gap. But the current suppliers of solutions, the main suppliers, banks, are not meeting the full needs of consumers in terms of their financial health, their financial wellness and success. On the other side, if that's on the demand side, on the supply side, the industries that are meant to be serving us, it's not looking very good. The business models are out of date. And if you look at the, the main financial industries, you can see at the bottom here, you can see this is some research that McKinsey did showing the economic profit of the top banks and insurance companies around the world. And economic profit is profit after cost of capital. And it was bad before COVID in the run up to the pandemic on the left. And it's due to get worse as digitalization bites. The types of business models that are working best, that were working best and are working even stronger still, accelerated by the pandemic are software based business models. And there are a number of 
financial institutions that have really adopted software business models. You can see some of them on the right. And they are now the most valuable financial institutions in the world as well. And indeed, the CEO of JP Morgan uh, said this recently about what I'm showing you here. And I think you can translate what he said to his colleagues as being very worried about the situation. So we have a problem on the demand side in terms of the solutions not being available to us. We have a problem on the supply side. The business models that we've run for many years are no longer delivering profit. They're no longer viable. So what do we do about this? Well, we need to understand what types of business models do work in a digital economy. And some work I did with the World Economic Forum recently tried to define the key archetypes of digital business models. Now, most companies spend most of their time today just digitizing their existing business model. And as we've just seen for banks and insurance companies, that's not a great business model. And digitizing something that isn't already delivering is not the best solution. Of course, as you know, there are many innovators that are creating intelligent digital solutions, filling the gap in that chart I showed before between what people need and what they're being offered by the traditional suppliers. And here's a few examples. And we're now starting to see the emergence of developer platforms, as we saw in other industries, emerging to serve innovators by giving them access to people's financial transactions so they can create new types of solutions on top. Online marketplaces are a very advanced type of digital business model, but are complicated to, to execute. And ultimately, the most successful companies in a digital world are those that orchestrate ecosystems around them. And some examples I, I, I've given at the top there. Most banks are still in number one here today, and most insurance companies are at number one. The innovators and the VC money is all focused on the air, on two to four, and the ultimate prize is when you can orchestrate a vibrant, self-sustaining ecosystem. And so this is the context in which embedded finance fits in. It's an amalgam of some of these types of business models, and I'll try and describe it to you. The best definition I, I tend to use is this here. It's about abstracting financial service functionality into technology to enable any product or service provider, any developer or retailer to integrate those innovative financial service elements into their own customer propositions and experiences. And they can either, either be visible complementary add-ons, i.e. new ways to pay for things at that point of sale or checkout, buy now, pay later, and so on. Or they can be completely invisible native components. Financial services is part of the overall experience that a company is trying to create. And one of the simplest examples of that is Uber. I don't have to get out my credit card to pay for the ride. Uber has embedded financial services into their proposition and it all happens in the background. And some examples on the right-hand side of companies that are really taking advantage of this. So Shopify, you probably know very well, it makes about half of its revenues from merchant services related to financial services. It's a big e-commerce platform on which lots of e-commerce uh, small businesses operate and it provides and makes money from payments and lending as well. Now, some of the big uh, software companies like QuickBooks uh, that provide the accounting products for many small businesses as well have been embedded, embedding payments, lending and insurance into their propositions and generating significant value from doing so. And Amazon Business has now started to do this at scale. So it's either digital companies like Uber or Shopify or Amazon or QuickBooks, but increasingly it's traditional types of manufacturers and retailers who make products and are seeing that if they can make it easy for people to buy their product and protect their product, then that makes the product itself more valuable. And the idea is that those types of brands and companies have much closer relationships with end customers than 
banks or insurance companies have. And they are best able to understand the needs of their customers and create personalized and relevant financial solutions than the bank or the insurance company is necessarily. So when I buy, uh, when I buy a product, I don't have to go to the bank to get a loan. I don't have to go to an insurance company to get it covered. It can be happening at the same place and time. And ultimately, the benefits for individuals and society is that if we can make this work at scale, we're creating much better customer experiences, which are faster, cheaper, and fairer as well. Uh, insurance that is much better priced than it is today. And the critical enabler are the new sources of data and open banking, particularly where I'm from in the UK, has been an enormous driver of innovation. And it's coming quickly to the US as well now, of course. And ultimately, financial inclusion. There's so many people that are not included, uh, don't, they're underserved, underbanked, underprotected, as we saw earlier on. And embedded finance creates the opportunity to match supply and demand much better. So I'll give you a few examples, commercial examples um, of the benefits of this. And if you take B2B software companies, I mentioned Intuit before, but take others that provide operating platforms for industries. In this case, Toast provides platforms for the restaurant industry. What they've found is that they can increase their total addressable market by a factor of up to five if they also offer payments, loans, and insurance, as well as their standard software. And they're in a very good position to do that because their software shows the creditworthiness, the status of their, of their customers in real time. And they're able to take that data and create much more tailored and personalized financial service solutions that suit those companies and make, them, and make offers related to them before those companies even think that they might need either insurance or additional loans. The other example is just any type of product uh, that you can buy on the market today, adding new ways to pay or new ways to protect your product uh, makes order values increase and increases conversion as well. And then finally, if you think about the broader societal benefit, um, this example on the right comes from China and Ant Group which because everybody uses Alipay to pay for things in, in rural China, they're able, they're much closer to the end customer than insurance companies are. And they've been able to create a marketplace of uh, 40 insurance companies that create much more affordable, attractive insurance solutions for people who never had any protection before. And they've brought online now over 100 million rural poor Chinese people that had no access to insurance before. Ant Group and Alipay educates the market. It understands the needs of the customers and what they can afford. It feeds back to the marketplace of suppliers what, market, what the market needs, and it helps the supply base to, to deliver that. And it makes very good money from uh, orchestrating that ecosystem. So there are very strong commercial benefits for organizations that want to embed finance into their own propositions. And this movement started with payments. And on the left-hand side is some analysis showing the proportion of payments that have been embedded uh, in the way I've just described and what the prognosis is moving forward. And you get to something like 40% of the market being embedded by third parties to enable new types of customer experiences. And because these are software companies that are enabling this, companies like Stripe, for example, the valuation multiple on the amount of revenue that they, they facilitate is about five times that revenue or more. And if you add payments together with the trends in lending and bigger markets like insurance, you get to a market opportunity of over $7 trillion. The, this is the, the value of the companies that are enabling embedded finance in 10 years time. So this is an enormous opportunity for 
entrepreneurs and VCs, and VCs are piling in huge amounts of money into this space. They call it fintech infrastructure. But also a golden opportunity for traditional incumbents to play in this space as well and create new value for themselves rather than being commoditized and disintermediated. And fundamentally, what we're seeing, because financial technology is becoming so sophisticated, it's now a new type of platform on which new innovation and new customers, uh, sorry, new companies are being built. And if you like, software companies took advantage of the internet, the cloud and mobile technology. And now we're seeing a huge uh, growth of companies taking advantage of financial technology as well. And you just look at the valuations of Stripe and Square and others, and Klarna recently as well. And we've, we've just start, we're just starting on this journey. Now, if the, if the uh, projections are correct, and even if they're not, we're essentially creating new businesses worth double the total value of the top 30 global financial institutions today in 10 years' time. So what a golden opportunity for those entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial companies to be part of this. So let me try and break down what's happening. And I'm going to show, give you a few examples uh, from the banking world of some good practice, particularly by incumbent organizations to stimulate you. And I'll end up by saying, talking about what I think the key critical success factors are for companies who want to take advantage of this. But essentially, on the left-hand side here, you can see the traditional financial service distribution chain from, from capital at the bottom to people who create products to the channels in the middle and the end customer. And today it's very product centric. Um, if I want a, an insurance product, I don't have a lot of choice. It's a question of pricing, perhaps not a lot else for me to choose from. And I go through brokers or I might go directly to an insurance company or a bank. And APIs are starting to allow these products to be exposed to more parties more efficiently. But how I see it going is as follows. Essentially, we're creating a new stack, a new method for financial services to be distributed. And what's happened, I've put some new flashes here on this diagram, and I'll try and explain them from the bottom up. There are new sources of capital, people who are looking for returns on investment. Uh, and it means it's a new supply of capital into the whole value chain. The second thing that, that's new is that through financial technology and this ability to abstract uh, financial service capability and embed it into technology, it's now possible that any product and service from any supplier can be made available and bundled together to create a new solution. So in the past, you had to, you know, for example, a retailer would work with a, an individual bank or an insurance company to create lending or insurance solutions. Now, the retailer, and I'll explain how in a second, has a choice of nearly any type of product underwritten by anybody combined with new capabilities to serve the needs of their customers. And what's enabling this is not APIs on their own, that's a technology activity, but it's this black layer. This is the new space that I'm most excited about at the moment. Essentially, these are new types of developer platforms that are enabling the supply of innovative products and services and capabilities to be made available to those brands and companies that have the closest relationship with the end user. And they are enabling to start with digital companies and initially fintech companies to bundle up in innovative solutions that were not possible in the past, but increasingly also any type of company, any retailer, big or small, to be able to embed financial services into their proposition. And higher up on this chart here, you see digital wallets as the new battleground because the wallet, if you, if you use the wallet to pay for things every day, that wallet can also be the, the, uh, the receptacle for other types of services related to payments and daily life activities. And that essentially is what Alipay has done uh, in China, created a digital wallet with enormous range of different services that can be accessed through that wallet and because it's a daily payment device, 
it's very, very relevant and frequently used by customers at the top. And what, what I, my contention is that we are now have the potential to bring many more customers into the market with many more personalized, affordable and compelling solutions that are integrated into their daily lives. And so we, we sit, we're currently somewhere between these two diagrams and the opportunity is to enable on the, what's what I've described on the, on the right there. And that black box, the developer platforms and the neo aggregators, I think is where the big, big market opportunity is. And today it's being grabbed by startups funded by VCs. But I think there's a golden opportunity also for incumbent players to take a role here. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of that. So let's look for a moment at banking as a service. So banking as a service is a subset of embedded finance and it can cover payments, lending and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and savings as well. And if we just look at the North American market here, we can see, I'm just breaking it down to show you some examples here, but the real power is lying at the top of this diagram. It's those brands that have very close regular interactions with customers who are trusted and well known. Uh, they have strong loyalty and they're looking to deepen that relationship by creating increasingly their own fintech solutions. So their own digital wallets, their payment capabilities and so on. They're looking to embed insurance and other things because these are very sticky uh, and powerful capabilities. Now you have other fintech brands like Chime, which have been incredibly successful uh, addressing gaps in the traditional market. And they, in the past, were limited to who could support them in bundling up new solutions. But now, on the developer platform layer, we're seeing a, a huge growth of new types of suppliers, which gives the fintech brands and the general brands greater choice about who can help them to embed more sophisticated uh, and broader set of financial solutions. Now, on that developer platform uh, layer that you can see in the middle there, the companies that have been innovators like Galileo and Marquetta have been very successful, Green Dot supporting Walmart over the years as well. But they're going to become under increased pressure as more players enter that market. And just having robust APIs is not gonna be enough. They need, need to be able to help brands to design and configure and innovate new solutions. And I believe that, that this is where the black uh, layer comes in. It's not just the technical capabilities of a developer platform, but it's also the capability to help the brands develop those solutions that are gonna be compelling for customers. The problem for the banks at the bottom is they're getting commoditized. So it was fine for some time for those who focused on becoming sponsor banks in the US, uh, but more and more banks will have that capability and uh, they will increasingly get commoditized. So what does this mean if you are uh, working for a bank or a traditional uh, financial service supplier? Let me talk, give you a few examples about how that side of the market is fighting back. And I'm gonna take you to Asia, Latin America, and we'll come back to the US. And this, from Asia, this is a great example of a traditional bank that has seen the opportunity in the market, but executed in a very different way. Rather than trying to execute from within the core bank, with all the challenges and cultural challenges and skills gaps and not invented here, mindsets of leaders which are very banking-centric and not technology-centric, what Standard Chartered did, it created a completely separate business called Nexus to create a full stack bank as a service platform from scratch, not using its legacy systems at all, using open source software. And what they do, they sell directly to the big e-commerce platforms, the big digital brands. And they've recently done a deal with a company called Bukalapak, which has 100 million consumers and 14 million merchants to provide them with financial services, savings, lending, um, bank account services that those 100 million consumers uh, didn't have before. And that's a great business for Standard Chartered. It's created a software business. It's now a player in the embedded finance market. 
and it has a nice relationship with a very large um, partner. But what it also means for the core bank is that it drives demand for the core banking services. So the bank as a service platform drives demand for new deposits, which the local Indonesian bank can supply. If the local bank tried to do this, it would never have worked at all. So Standard Charter, by creating a separate business focused on creating a fintech BAS platform as a separate venture, gave it the space and the power and to attract entrepreneurs and skillful technologists to be able to enable this model. And by driving deposits back to the local bank, it satisfies the core business that the core business is growing as well. So that, that's a really important principle here for a traditional company. And in um, Mexico, a Banco Sabadell is probably one of the best examples of a bank I've seen, again, that created a separate unit to create a separate BAS platform proposition. It has been selling that to large embedding brands um, and winning business against the fintech uh, suppliers in the marketplace. Big, very big international retailers and, uh, in this case, uh, telcos. They get access to 20 million customers from Telefonica. Um, by combining Telefonica's data with the bank data, they're able to create much more attractive lending solutions in, their, in this particular case, um, which is growing business for them and Telefonica and bringing many more people in Mexico who are underserved for, by the traditional lenders into the market. And again, it's driving demand for the core business as well. So if we then come to the US, one of the best examples that I, I've seen is Goldman Sachs. And they've said, as you probably well know, is that developers are our customers now. They are the people that act as the intermediaries between us and our capabilities, the brands that have the close relationship with the customers, the embedders, and then the end user. And so their bank as a service platform supports not only their new consumer business, Marcus, it also supports their new transaction services business um, and supports all the activity of Goldman Sachs in terms of trying to attract new customers. But ultimately, by supporting third party embedding brands like Apple and others, it attracts a whole new customer base into the Goldman Sachs ecosystem and is creating, and is, I think is one of the best examples of real commitment to the embedded finance model by a traditional player, enabling it to enter new market spaces. So let's just finish off now with uh, key success factors. And I've got one slide after this, which where I'm gonna suggest the, the foundational requirement to be successful. But we do need a clear vision for where we're going to play in this market. And often traditional leaders at traditional companies find it difficult to think about new digital business models and how they can play in this market. But we need to help them understand the opportunity and then create a rich portfolio of solutions. It's not a, a case of making an arm's length investment in a startup or doing a little bit of dabbling. We need to create a rich portfolio of bold moves if we're going to take advantage of this seven trillion opportunity. We need new insights to help us understand where those opportunities lie, and we need to be prepared to create new commercial models. But my contention is you cannot do this very successfully from within the core business. You need, in the, like the examples I gave before, to create a separate space in which innovation can happen with different metrics, with attracting different people, with ring-fenced investment at a significant level. And you need to be able to adopt new scale-up methods. The old traditional way of creating products is not gonna work anymore. And you need find, finally to make it tangible and demonstrate the value to not only shareholders, but also to the rest of the organization. And that example I gave uh, from Standard Chartered to show not only is this a growth opportunity for a new venture that we create, but it's going to be driving demand for our core business as well. And getting that um, business case right is really important. It's going to optimize and improve the core. It's also going to fast track the future. But the number one foundational requirement is this ambidextrous organization. 
you cannot do disruptive innovation from within the core business. Certainly, you need to API eyes, if you like, the core business. You need to datafy and automate everything to be able for those assets and capabilities to be exploited effectively. But to create the new ventures that can play in this seven trillion dollar market, you need to create a separate space, and you need to create either internal ventures or ventures with external entrepreneurs where you set up separate equity structures to do that, or you need to collaborate with fintechs and manage very specific type of M&A. And that approach is the approach that's worked, that has worked best for the companies that have been most successful in this market. In fact, in terms of digital markets in general, the, the starting point is to really define at a strategic level, where are we gonna play and how are we going to win? And then create the new governance mechanism for doing the innovation that both optimizes the core and fast tracks the future. So I hope this has been useful and stimulating. I'm looking forward to discussing it more with you next. Thank you so much. And do please, if you like what you're hearing, follow me on LinkedIn and I'd love to interact with you if you want to drop me an email. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it was really a compelling presentation explaining a lot of stuff in the industry. And I, I wanted to ask you our first question, like in this, let's say embedded finance, APIs are just a mindset. They are a technology. They are both. What's your opinion about it? Well, they're, they're, they're necessary, but insufficient. So yes, you need to be able to expose your capabilities but you do need this black box that I showed at that diagram halfway through. The black box, that layer, is the layer that helps other people take technical capabilities and turn them into something that commercially useful. And that's the bit that is missing at the moment in the marketplace. Because you know, I speak to a lot of um, not, you know, brands like retailers and telcos, and they don't know what to do with financial APIs because you know that they don't know what they don't know about financial products and services that's not their business they need somebody or some organization to help them to take all that capability and make sense of it and so that they can learn how to create their own solutions for their end customers so it seems many of the companies you're referring to are where API first company like the Stripe and others, like they, re, they, they had APIs directly in the first strategy of the company, sometimes being the only strategy. Can big corporation adopt such a strategy on the cultural side? Well, uh, yeah, I, so technically, to, I mean, this is, and this is what Jeff Bezos said for, from, from Amazon, everything has to be interconnectable. Everything needs to have an API. So that's just the mandate that should be put out to any organization nowadays, you know, because they all operate in the digital economy. So all your products and services and capabilities need to be exposable. So that's just table stakes. If you're not doing that, you're, you're behind the times. But that's not enough. You, you, you also need to help other people work out how to embed those capabilities into their own solutions. And again, that's the gap that exists. And the difficulty there is that those skills don't reside within the traditional incumbent bank or insurance company. And that's why you're getting a lot of startups backed by VC filling that gap. You know, a lot of the so-called B2B infrastructure players or developer platforms uh, that are emerging now and, and doing extremely well. Um, and, you know, that's where Stripe came in as well to fill part of that gap. So the traditional incumbent organizations, they have these incredible assets, but they are not capable of creating the, I guess, the thing that is translating them commercially. And that's why the examples I gave, like Standard Chartered, where they created a completely separate business to create an embedded finance or a bank as a service solution business that, that could go directly to large brands and digital platforms and sell the total solution because the core bank couldn't do that. They don't, their salespeople don't know how to sell technology, it's not their business, it's not their skills. But if you create a separate organization, you can then create different metrics. You can then, in many cases, some of the best approaches to create it as a separate equity uh, vehicle 
then you can attract really talented, incentivized, uh, talented entrepreneurs to run it. And then you can use the assets of the core business, which is access to lots of customers. And that gives you an unfair advantage against the, the, the startups you know, starting from nothing. So that, that approach, I think, is probably, well, is definitely the, the better approach when, you, when a traditional incumbent organization wants to play in a market which is very different from its core business. So yeah, and, and I repeat for all people listening, uh, you can ask questions directly on Hopping platform or in the Twitter live or the LinkedIn live or uh, on other channels where it's actually streamed. So we, are, we have a lot of questions. Actually, we have one question about uh, China. Does the fact that China is behind the firewall has helped to be more embedded like with, uh, uh, I, take the, uh, I, I take the personal example of, uh, you know, what we call hyper apps, you know, like the WhatsApps and others like who are completely embedded. Does the great firewall has helped to be more embedded to your mind? I don't think the great firewall, I mean, the fact that it's, you know, you can't access, you know, certain Western services from China. I don't think that really makes any difference. But China is where the real innovation, business model innovation has happened uh, here. So the example I gave with Alipay and Ant Group is a really, you know, really great example. And there's no real reason why uh, other, you know, digital companies in the West can't adopt or adapt that model. Uh, and we're starting to see... Google Pay, PayPal, Revolut, Tinkoff Bank in Russia, and, and others try to, to follow the model of what you call the hyper app or the super app, other people call it. And all that's saying is that you know, you're, the, the more services you can wrap around what you do, the stickier and more attractive you are for, for your customers so they don't go elsewhere. And financial services is a very nice, sticky, um, you know, set of services, of course. And what, what Alipay did in China is that they created a platform and a marketplace for insurance to insure the underinsured or the uninsured. And it was nothing to do with the Chinese, I mean, the Chinese, the nature of the Chinese market. There is this group of people who just didn't have any protection. In the US, it's the same. There's vast numbers of people who are underprotected because the traditional supply of insurance or even credit does not match them. They, they, it doesn't suit their, their commercial model. So we've got this enormous volume of people that are unprotected, underbanked, underserved. And that's because the supply side, traditional players, have not worked out how to make it economically attractive to serve those people. But in China, because the, the numbers have been, you know, when you've got 100 million people you could engage with, the incentives have been very strong and the innovative approach, rather than thinking about how things were done in the past, because the, the, the past didn't exist, you know, they just leapfrogged ahead. We've got this problem, how do we solve it? And that, you know, that has driven real innovation from people like uh, Alipay and Ant Group to serve people who in the past were very well, completely not served at all. And those principles can be brought to the US and, and Latin America and Europe as well. And uh, we're seeing, because as I showed right at the beginning, the, the existing business model in the financial services industry is not working. So something's got to change. <laughs> so they've got to do something different because um, it's unsustainable. So that all these pressures mean that we do need to make much bolder moves than we've done in the past. And there is an enormous societal benefit if we do this. And at the moment, all that capability is trapped, locked away within traditional organizations. All the data about my, my transactions, my history, and so on and so forth, locked away. Open banking in the UK has, has released that. And it's going, to be, it's going to stimulate a huge explosion of greater innovation in the US as well. So in your book, Fight Back, you explain how a larger organization can fight back or counter strike or, you know, take back, uh, 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 let's say, the market that, that is being owned uh, piece by piece by uh, like disruptors, uh, uh, as, we, as, we, as we could say. But the thing is, uh, how long really do they have the $7.2 trillion opportunity, at least, you know, like the, the doubling of it. So the $3.2 trillion opportunity 
with uh, how how long, let's say, uh, uh, for how long big companies can still survive in this in this economy and take a large part of it uh, um, before adopting, you know, this platform orchestrator of networks and API driven models. Yeah, they've got. I mean, the reality is that they, or let's say, traditional big incumbents, or, or, or many of them, have got quite a bit of time because they've got large customer bases. Most customers are pretty um, lazy; they don't want to change. I've been with my bank for thirty years now. I haven't never changed. I don't get any great value from them, but you know, I, I can't be bothered to change. Um, so they, they they have some time on their side. Um, uh, but it's the ones that make the move quickest that will be the biggest, the most successful. Those who are slow, who wait for that, particularly when they wait for a direct local competitor to move, they're going to be even more pressurized. So if your direct competitor uh, doesn't move and you don't move, yeah, that, then you've got a bit more time because the, the, the small startups, you know, they, they're nibbling away, but they're not going to really move the needle too much in the short term. But as soon as your direct competitor, the, the other incumbent in your market who has the trust, the brand, the distribution, the, the, the assets and the capital, when they make bold moves, that's when you start to get in trouble because then customers will shift because of you have that trust. So you cannot be complacent. Um, and it's probably not a good idea to assume that your other close competitors are are not going to do anything. So um, they, there is time, but the winners will be the ones that make bold moves as, uh, quickly. It reminds me the book uh, from uh, Jason Jennings and uh, Lawrence Houghton, like it's not the big who hit the small, it's the fast who hit the slow, really reminds me that uh, uh, that quote. So the theme of the event is API-driven regulations. You know, we had uh, in Europe, we had PSD2. In UK, we had Open Banking UK for obliging banks to open APIs for open banking, at least nine big banks. In Europe, it's all the banks with PSD2. Singapore is having regulation. US, the FCC is thinking about regulations. We also have regulation in healthcare coming, obliging to open APIs at some point. Um, we have also privacy regulations, obliging to share data with people most of the time by APIs. So in this forced opening of APIs, in this forced innovation mindset, like well, how companies should thrive uh, into this and what's the idea, uh, what's the impact when regulation takes care of, of your APIs? Yeah, well then, <laughs> then regulation is forcing innovation. As you say, it's been a great uh, success in the UK and it's coming, it sounds like it's coming to the US as well now. So it's forcing greater innovation into the market and uh, that creates opportunities and threats, of course. So I think it means that, you know, we for all the things you've mentioned there, it means there's even less time to lose to work out the two questions, you know, for any organization are where to play in a new emerging market and secondly how to win and uh, i spend a lot of my time trying to help companies answer those those questions but it's the same across i, I mean, i'm working with banks at the moment insurance companies reinsurers wealth management companies you know incumbents in those spaces and they're all wrestling with those topics um, some quicker than others but I, there's still quite a bit of complacency, I would say, and uh, I think they need to speed that up. So regulation, if it's good regulation, stimulates innovation. Um, and certainly, I think open banking and what we're seeing in other sectors, open finance and open data in general, is a very good thing. Uh, particularly, I think, because we've learned a lot of the lessons about privacy and we've created, I think, reasonable frameworks in which privacy can be managed uh, now. Yeah, and about uh, this uh, uh, government government regulation, we have a question about the China, especially about China. If you if you know the the answer, question from John about uh, uh, how much China prog progress has been made due to the role of government dictating adoption of technology opposed to, to market forces. No, no, I think it's market forces there primarily because I mean, you know, I mean, if you, you I, I give one of the best examples here. So in in the insurance industry. You know, it, it's a, it was, you know, 30, 40 years, it's been a nice industry because a lot of people never had any insurance and traditional insurance companies grew up and serviced them. But the company that did the best was not driven by any regulation or, or changes from the government. They got a license 
And then they are now the, the by far the leading insurance company uh, and the seventh most valuable company of any financial institution in the world. And that's Ping An. And what Ping An did, it had a entrepreneurial leader who was the founder of the company and um, the CEO over the time. And he said, you know, I'm battling it out with the other insurance companies. We're all working within the regulations and the market's growing quite well because China's, you know, becoming more middle class, which is which is all fine. But he said, that's not enough for me. I can see if I look at what Alibaba is doing or what's going on in Silicon Valley, you know, and the world's digitizing so quickly, my God, I can see, you know, we, we, are, we just don't have a business model like that. We've got a very traditional business model. And all his competitors, you know, carried on the same. They, they the traditional insurance business model, which I, as I've showed is now getting under pressure. So what he did, he said, we're not going to be an insurance company anymore. We're going to be a technology company, a platform business that happens to have financial services licenses. And that just saying that is an enormous step forward. No government was telling him to do that. That's pure market forces. And so he, looking at what was going on in Silicon Valley with digital platforms, with Alibaba and others, he said, let's get closer to the for the day-to-day -day life of our of our customers because insurance is really boring you buy it and you die or you buy it and you crash your car everything in between is you have no relationship with the insurance company and it's really all those aspects are really dull and difficult and not interesting but people want to buy cars they want to buy houses they want they need to go to the doctor they need to be entertained so they created a set of ventures in those spaces which are nothing to do with financial services created equity structures that attracted entrepreneurs to run them. And they created then their own set of platforms, which then drove demand for financial services. Because financial, because you need financial services to buy and sell cars, you need insurance, you, you, know, you need all, all, all those things. Now, what happened then, that he created this ecosystem, interconnected ecosystem, 40% of their new business comes from those non-financial services ventures that he created. So he's created a new demand from nothing. And they have become, as I said, the seventh most valuable financial institution in the world. So, so the answer really, the short answer is no, not really. It's because there's real energy and entrepreneurial dynamism there that, that we can, we in the West can learn from, certainly. So we have a question from, uh, from Twitter from Michael is, about embedding the embedded uh, strategy. Is it the new who embeds the old, or the big, or the big who embeds uh, the small? And behind that, I'm thinking about uh, last year conference we had TransferWise. So TransferWise, you know, it's this money exchange platform, money transfer platform, and now they have TransferWise for banks because some banks are not good about do money, doing money transfer. So they try to be embedded as a bank in other people's applications, but they also embed some new or uh, you know, uh, better, uh, better suited uh, services inside their core to resell it to others. So who embeds who? Well, anybody, that's the point. Any, anybody can embed anything that now. I mean, that, that's the whole great thing about it. So, you know, I can be a retailer of bikes and I can embed, I can embed insurance now, you know, like that really fast because there are these platforms that are enabling it. Again, it's not just the AP, the, the raw APIs are not doing it, but it's companies coming in, creating these platforms, the, the, the black bit in my diagram that enable a small bicycle re, uh, retailer to offer insurance at point of sale when someone buys an expensive bike. And the margin on that for the small bicycle retailer is about 99%. You know, it's very, it's high margin. And most, <laughs> their core business margin is tiny, but this is adding a large amount of margin as I showed from some of those other examples. So that's what's driving. And, you know, they are, in theory, anybody's able to combine and bundle anything. So it's, it's the big and the small, the small and the big, you know, in any configuration. You know, uh, it reminds me, uh, I've, I've lived five years in the Silicon Valley and there's this quote, like, there is only two business models. It's bundling or unbundling. And <laughs> are you saying that we are in a in a bundling era? It's the goal is to be to embed others or be embedded by others? Really? Well, it, it's, yeah, because we had the first wave of fintech, which was unbundling. But now, because fin financial technology has become very sophisticated, It means, as I tried to show, any type of capability 
any type of product, any type of service, any type of uh, capability can be now reassembled. So we disassembled, we modularized everything like Lego. And now all, that, all those Lego pieces exist out there. And so anybody can reconfigure them, but you need a, you need a, you know, you need a, a, a guide to do it and you need a customer. So, and that's the bit, you, there are the new, the people who have the customers are the big brands, but the people who are creating the guide, this is how you do it. That's the bit that's missing in the market. All the Lego is out there. Yeah, for the last minute we have, what would be your advice to either um, API driven business startups or big organization thinking in terms of uh, adopting API soon? What would be your advice uh, about embedded banking? Yeah, so, so for big organizations, absolutely, you need to API eyes everything or you know as much as possible. That's just an IT uh, table stakes activity. To, to, to win though in the $7 trillion market space, you need to create new ventures, which are providing the, gu the Lego guides, if you like, or the black box that I described. That's the winning, that's the golden opportunity. And you saw some examples of some incumbents that are doing that. And then for startups, again, I believe that providing that, that, that service, the guide is, the, is a golden opportunity as well. It seems there, as we say, there, there is enough beers and pizzas for everybody in the embedded finance. Yes. Yeah. So let's uh, let's share this, this value all together. Thank you very much, Simon, for being there and being in the opening keynote. Uh, we we've received many many great feedbacks already on all the channels. Uh, it was expected. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. And again, uh, maybe last point: where we can find more about your work. If you go LinkedIn, is probably the best place. Just follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I do have a blog, but LinkedIn is the starting point, I think. So please do connect there. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Have a good day. And if you have anything as attendees, uh, you want to know more about Simon's work, you can go on LinkedIn or try to uh, chat with him directly uh, on the platform or uh, via all the social networks. Thank you, Simon. And now